We're going to look beyond 2015 to sustainable infrastructure for Africa's transformation. Now, Africa is sometimes seen as the poor relation in terms of development, but I'd argue that only to those who've not been keeping up with the latest innovations that are underway on that continent. To take just one example that I've seen at first hand myself recently, the rapid spread of solar power in East Africa in particular, combined with mobile money transfer and new smart energy technologies, which is revolutionizing life for millions. That's just one example, there are many more. I'm sure we're gonna hear some from our next panel. So I'm going to invite them up in turn on the stage. First of all, Dr. Araya Asfo, who's director of the Horn of Africa Regional Environment Center and Network in Addis Ababa. <laughs> Dr. Asfo. <laughs> Mr. Martin Hiller, director general of the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership, REAP for long. Ambassador Nalin Suri, Director General, the Indian Council of World Affairs. And I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, Miyaza Ashanafi, an advisor on women's rights at the UNFCA, one of the most prominent women's rights activists on the continent. <laughs> Ambassador Ajay Malhotra, Distinguished Fellow of Terry. And our chair, Mr. Nitin Desai. And once they finish playing musical chairs, I will hand over to our chair. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, let me welcome the uh, panelists to this uh, very interesting session on the infrastructure needs in Africa. Uh, at the global level, one of the very interesting stories of the past more than a decade has been the revival of African growth and development. Things are happening there which uh, are really very promising. So we are very, uh, it's uh, something which also concerns us very much in India because we are neighbors with Africa. So it's particularly appropriate that we should be discussing this in this uh, World Summit on Sustainable Development. We have an excellent panel and the first speaker I'll call on is uh, right here with me, Dr. Araya Asfo. And he's a scientist. He's uh, both a physicist as well as an engineer, having done both. He has worked in many laboratories in the US. But about 20 years ago, he moved to Addis. First into the setting up the, the, in the university, and there in the university, he set up the center, which was the Horn of Africa Regional Environment Center, which he heads now. Uh, and I'm sure he'll be able to give us a perspective on what is it that Africa needs for sustainable development over the next few decades. Uh, we also have with, with us, uh, you know, the, right next to him, Miza Ashnafi. As we were, you were told, she is somebody who has been quite involved in uh, gender issues. She's worked on human rights, women's rights, gender. But one of the important things that connects her interests with us is that she has uh, recently founded the first women's bank in Ethiopia. And obviously, this will, will play an important role in sustainable development there. Uh, I have then Martin Hiller. Martin Hiller heads a program which was set up uh, uh, partly after the Johannesburg Summit. I happen to have been Secretary General of that summit at that time, so I'm very happy to see one of the products of that summit here uh, a good uh, almost 15 years later. And nice, so he took over some time back, but uh, he has had a, a, a long involvement in the areas of carbon, particularly where he was heading this uh, uh, certification type center for the gold standard the, for carbon emissions. And then I have, how shall I describe them? Two economists from Delhi School. <laughs> And uh, both of them uh, did their, uh, you know, uh, forgot the economics and joined the Foreign Service. <laughs> and so I with me, Nalin Suri, of course, we've known each other, and so have I known Ajay for a long time. Nalin was, has done many diplomatic postings. The time when we were, of course, together was in New York, and I think his last posting was as High Commissioner in UK. He now heads the Indian Council of World Affairs, uh, an institution which he has revived and which has become much more active 
in the think tank space now than it uh, used to be. Ajay is with us in Terry as a senior fellow, uh, handling issues dealing with climate change. He's had a long history of involvement in environmental negotiations on behalf of the government ranging over a very wide field. And, uh, so I'm, and besides that, of course, he's held many diplomatic assignments. The time that I know of him most is, of course, when he was in Russia. As, uh, uh, the, well, you had two stints in Russia, if I remember right. Uh, right. As ambassador and earlier also. It's in your earlier capacity that we knew. Three stints, three stints actually. Okay. Now that, that, is, that is something. You know, to serve three times in Russia is definitely uh, beyond the call of duty. So many thanks to all of you for being here. Let me start first with you, Dr. Ashford. You may wish to speak from there. You can most as well. I would suggest we pay, stay in sort of five, seven minutes each so that we have time for some interaction. Uh, thank you, Terry, for the invitation uh, to speak on this important topic, uh, Africa's infrastructure, infrastructure development transformation. Uh, I will give a short presentation, maybe a few minutes, since I have been working as a uh, in the Horn of Africa for the last uh, decade and more, uh, mainly to, as you know, this region is one of the fragile region uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Africa and it's also a global concern. Uh, one of the um, uh, major driver of change, one way or another, is the population. Uh, currently, the region, uh, the eight countries in the region uh, have a population of uh, over 230 million. And um, Ethiopia takes uh, the major lion share. And Ethiopia is also the one that basically connected to uh, seven of the eight countries in the Horn of Africa. So it has um, um, uh, many other important uh, um, uh, factors. So um, the, the population is also increasing uh, very rapidly and uh, you know soon the the region population will surpass that of the United States uh, maybe in the decades uh, uh, ahead uh, as you can see that uh, you know uh, very high uh, uh, fertility rate you know uh, is uh, in this in the region if we look at Ethiopia more carefully we see that um, you know, over the last uh, 50 years, on the average, the population have increased uh, uh, or uh, added uh, the size, the population size of New York City or um, uh, Sweden every decade. So uh, from uh, uh, 1950 to now, it has actually quadrupled uh, in population. And uh, this trend is going to continue because, uh, you know, 40% uh, of the population is below the age of 14, and more than 50% of the population is between the age of 15 and uh, um, 65. So before the population stabilizes, uh, this trend is uh, going to continue to, uh, in the next uh, decade or so. So this is again a major concern. Um, what is the impact? What you see here is uh, those little dots, what you see, this is basically the uh, highlands of Ethiopia, where, uh, which is the source of the Blue Nile. Those are the remaining forests protected by the church. And uh, 50 years ago, uh, you know, this entire region was basically covered with forest. So this is the human impact. Uh, on, on the uh, environment. Um, energy poverty is the major issue. This is the injera, which we call just like uh, chapati, uh, which we eat, uh, 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 use it for, uh, 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 but uh, it's cooked traditionally with three fire stone. And um, you see wood market all over the country. So one of the major driver of uh, deforestation, aside from agricultural expansion, is, is uh, fuel wood and charcoal. Um, you see kids you know, fetching uh, woods 
uh, every day for cooking. So energy transformation is key. And uh, over the last um, 10 years or so, the government of Ethiopia has made a major uh, uh, plan to uh, transform the energy use. And this is basically one of the things is that uh, uh, huge expansion in hydroelectric power, mainly from uh, hydropower. And um, in 2010, as you can see, the energy, the power consumption was about 20 watt per person. But now, uh, with the new strategy by 2025, the electricity generation will reach about uh, 12.5 gigawatt. And um, so this is, comes out to be maybe about 100 watt. But this is not a lot. But also, uh, Ethiopia shares all of the rivers with the neighboring country. There are 12 river basins, and all these rivers are shared by, by the neighboring countries. So electricity generated from uh, hydropower has to be also shared uh, with the other countries. So, you know, this means that no matter how much you invest in electricity, uh, there is going to be the demand is going to increase. And also, this has to be shared with the um, uh, neighboring countries. So, <clears throat> um, from the demand side, uh, the government also has taken a major undertaking, especially in, um, in transportation sector. The, there is a, a 740 kilometer uh, electric railway, which was, uh, uh, which will be inaugurated hopefully in the, before the end of the year. Uh, the impact of this is, uh, you know, um, first of all, it's going to displace 50% of the imported diesel. 50% of the diesel is used to transport goods from the port of Djibouti to Addis Ababa. So that means if electricity is an uh, electric train um, replaces that, uh, you basically displace a uh, you know, huge amount of uh, uh, diesel. On the other hand, also in terms of energy security, since 7% uh, of the primary energy is imported oil, and 50% of that is diesel. And it, it basically consumes over 70% of the the uh, um, uh, foreign exchange, okay, or the export earning. So, in terms of energy security and also economic stability, since uh, oil is a very volatile market and always the economy, uh, you know, if uh, you know is uh, when it depends on oil, uh, it's uh, highly vulnerable. So, this also in terms of uh, macroeconomic uh, stability. Uh, this kind of uh, energy security has a very important role uh, as well. Now, in the next five years, the government is also planning to uh, put 5,000 kilometers of railways across the country. So this will cost probably over $25 billion at that rate, but this Connection has two advantages. One is, you know, especially for, uh, uh, you know, to uh, access market for goods and services, and at the same time, it's especially in the in the in the uh, neighboring countries, and um, so, one hand, uh, you know, it really stimulates the economy. Uh, the, on the other hand, also uh, uh, helps, uh, you know, regional integration. And if every country in the neighboring region have the same kind of strategy, hopefully by 2030, then you know, uh, we can have infrastructure development in the Horn of Africa as a whole. So that will basically stimulate you know, uh, integration, economic integration, also stability, because they have to also um, uh, use uh, common resources. So, um, in this sense, infrastructure plays a big role, but on the other hand, this is only 
You know, we shouldn't only focus on the hard components, but at the same time, this is a huge investment, $25 billion for electricity, $24 billion for uh, uh, railway. But at the same time, the investment has to pay off. That is, it has to stimulate the economy, and also we need to think about more of uh, uh, dealing with issues on how, on labor movement between countries and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, in other aspects of the uh, regional integration. So uh, the infrastructure development from country to the region and then as a whole, you know, we should think about how Africa could actually be uh, integrated. And without infrastructure, there is no integration. And uh, in that sense, uh, we consider the, the subject very important. Thank you very much. To Miyaza Ashrafi. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Maaza Shanafi. I also come uh, from Ethiopia. I don't have any uh, prepared uh, in the packaged presentation because uh, I'm co-opted to this panel just five minutes ago. But uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm a lawyer, so I take every opportunity for advocacy. So I, I am uh, speaking to you uh, on, uh, in that sense this afternoon. Uh, my um, remark, my few remarks will, will be uh, quite general. Uh, the first remark that I would like to make is uh, the importance of South-South uh, uh, collaboration and the knowledge transfer. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, Dr. Araya is uh, uh, able to make a presentation about uh, the Horn of uh, Africa. Uh, but I think uh, I would like to suggest in uh, future uh, discussions and uh, global forums like this, it would be uh, fantastic to hear uh, the, vo the voices of uh, uh, African countries and uh, to exchange knowledge and experience in regards to what is happening in Africa. Uh, because I know that, uh, for example, uh, five of the uh, fastest growing economies are uh, based in Africa, and it, was, it, would, it would be quite interesting to debate, uh, you know, the content of this development. Uh, is it uh, sustainable? Is it uh, uh, environmentally and ecologically um, uh, uh, advanced? Uh, what is the role of uh, women and what is the role of the youth? And uh, how is sustainability um, understood in, in different parts of the world. Uh, my second point would be about uh, women and uh, participation of uh, uh, the issue of gender equality and the women's uh, empowerment. Uh, the issue of gender mainstreaming uh, cannot be uh, business as usual. Uh, and gender mainstreaming is not uh, an add-on but it has to be a key uh, strategy, especially when we talk about sustainable development, because sustainability is about uh, inclusivity and about ensuring the participation of the most marginalized uh, part of the society. Uh, some people do not quite link uh, the relationship between infrastructure and women. Uh, for example, in Africa, uh, most of the food is uh, produced by women, and women are also uh, sellers. They are uh, the ones who carry food to the market. So access to uh, road and uh, road networks are quite important to facilitate uh, the lives of uh, women. Or if we're talking about uh, clean uh, water, uh, on the average, depending on the statistics you look, you look at, women spend about four hours a day looking for a clean water. So that is not a very effective way of uh, using human resource because that takes time from uh, their opportunity for education or training or investing time uh, in their family and on their family and uh, you know, development and education of their uh, children. Uh, 
Uh, we also know about uh, the health damage that's caused uh, because of uh, uh, biomass fuel. And uh, uh, we know that how much uh, the uh, clean cook energy is being promoted in most developing countries, including Africa. Um, and also, if we talk about information and um, uh, knowledge transfer, unless women have access to power, they can't even have access to, uh, you know, information on the radio. And this information could be a matter of uh, life and the days. Uh, for example, it could be information about uh, reproductive health and reproductive services, uh, which is really uh, critical uh, for women. Uh, and our chairperson uh, introduced me um, as a, the chairperson, the founding chairperson of uh, a women's bank in Ethiopia. Uh, I'd like to say just a few things uh, about the bank. Uh, this bank uh, was established by 11 women, and uh, about 70% of the equity is owned by women. It is a women-focused uh, commercial bank, and uh, it's considered to be one of the good practices in uh, uh, Africa. Uh, the, yesterday, uh, the Terry Center was signing a memorandum of understanding with one prominent bank here uh, in, in India. And uh, I would also like to start a conversation with the Terry Center in, in regards to knowledge transfer and how uh, the bank, uh, our bank can benefit from um, such knowledge in order to be able to invest in green uh, businesses. And that will be one of my takeaways from uh, this conference. Uh, and finally, I'd like to flag uh, three uh, issues for uh, discussion. These are not necessarily uh, scientific discussions, but I'd like us to focus on implementation of uh, sustainable uh, development strategies. Uh, for example, in the, in the case of Africa, there is Agenda 2063, uh, which is uh, designed by the African Union. African Union has 54 uh, member states. I'm sure there are similar long-term and medium-term uh, strategies and uh, action plans at the level of Asia. So I would like us to uh, have a conversation about the linkage between uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and this kind of regional uh, initiatives. Uh, I also think that it would, it would be good to uh, discuss a little bit about the financing. How do we finance these different initiatives, whether it is a Paris Agreement or sustainable, the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Where do we get the money to uh, finance these development initiatives? Uh, and finally, uh, I would also like to flag about the approach, our approach. If we talk about inclusive and sustainable development, uh, we cannot continue to uh, make decisions, top-down top decisions. We have to empower society. We have to empower the major stakeholders. So what kind of strategy can we follow to um, empower the youth, empower women, and empower the society at large so that our future, future development is uh, truly inclusive and sustainable. Thank you very much for your Thank attention. Thank you very much. May I now ask Martin Hill, please? Thank you, Nitin. I, I, I never know, should I address you as Nitin or should I address you as Your Excellency? I remember the time uh, from Johannesburg as well, and your name, you have been around in the I, scene. I, I, I'm, I'm far from many things, but right now I'm plain Mr. Desai. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Desai. So I will say Mr. Desai. Thank you, Mr. Desai. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, lead an organization that is called REAP, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership. We are a front-runner organization that tries to find new ways of engaging to uh, solve problems of deployment of renewables, of energy efficiency, and especially also of energy access. In that sense, we do, uh, do a considerable part of our work in Africa, especially in Eastern Africa and in Southern Africa. And we are focusing our work along a line that we call invest, learn, and share. Uh, we're specifically interested in finding investment opportunities and learning about market development for new frontier markets. So markets that actually 
aren't working as markets per se yet, but could be uh, improved or the livelihoods and the prosperity chances for people could be improved if a market were developed. That's things like uh, you know, productive energy, but also solar home systems, etc. I'll give you two examples in a moment. Um, the second point that we are very interested in that context is that we are not just helping some companies or some sectors to evolve, but that we establish systems where the sector, we, we ourselves, but especially all our partners, the sector, the policymakers, the financiers in the country can actually start to get more information about these sectors. They can learn about these sectors. So it's basically a market analytic approach. Um, before I go into the two examples, I just want to say I was in, in Kenya last week again. And every time I'm in Africa, I'm impressed by the level of commitment, the level of engagement, the level of creativity and the dynamic that I find in these markets. These are poor markets. I, I was chairing a, a, a panel discussion last week at IOREC in, in Nairobi, where I had one Indian representative and two African Kenyan entrepreneurs uh, on the panel. And the contrast between the countries is, is stark. Where in India, you have an incredible education system. You have an incredibly strong banking system, also in rural areas. I do understand that there are still a lot of things to do and to do better, but the same infrastructure does not necessarily exist, exist in, in every African country. Um, so what Kenya did on the banking sector, for instance, the reaction in Kenya was that mobile phone banking became uh, very strong in Kenya. And everybody knows Kenya is kind of very strong in that, but nobody knows that in th indeed, in terms of mobile phone banking, Kenya is the global leader. This is, they have a, a far over 50% of, of trading that's happening in Kenya is happening through mobile phones. Uh, so this is a, a really, really strong development. That's leapfrogging in action. So there is a lot that one can go to Africa and learn from Africa. Um, and uh, it's a fascinating place to, to, uh, to work and to help people to, uh, to uh, uh, do their ventures and their initiatives. Um, one area that we're working in, one country that we're working in is Zambia. This is a project that is financed by the government of Sweden and by CEDA, the Swedish Development Agency, and it's a rural electrification project. Uh, Zambia has still a very weak uh, grid infrastructure, uh, which is very much focused on the cities and on the big mining areas. But in rural areas and even in peri-urban area, areas, grid uh, extension is very weak. There recently also are a lot of blackouts uh, and brownouts, uh, so there is a real challenge for people to get to electricity. This program is a 20 million euro fund, a grant fund, that actually wants to attract and stimulate the deployment of solar home systems. And the Swedes have asked REAP to develop a procurement system whereby the grants that they give buy, in inverted commas, buy a um, off-grid electricity connections, solar home system connections. We using we developed this system. We're using the tier system for energy access tracking that the World Bank developed for uh, sustainable energy energy for all, um, as an as a system to understand what type of connections the companies will deploy, and the companies can basically come to Sweden and to us and say, with their business plan and say we want to get a grant of three million over two years, and we will deploy so many connections in tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five, um, which allows us to price the connections and at the same time value the business plan. Is the business plan solid enough? And that's a, a something I can't say much more. This evaluation is at the moment going on and decisions are going to be made very shortly, but it's a new, a, a new way of, uh, of deploying um, uh, um, off-grid systems or of buying off-grid systems and we will see if it's going to be successful. We do add a strong monitoring evaluation and learning component and whenever I say monitoring evaluation and learning people start to yawn and think back to school and I don't know uh, or to, to very tedious uh, evaluation reports but actually this part is incredibly important for advancing these new markets. The monitoring evaluation a bit needs to be set up at the very beginning of a project so that we really can 
draw out the learnings from each of the projects that we're doing, each of the projects that are being financed. If we don't do that, we basically lose half of the value. Uh, so we're very keen, REAP is very, very keen on implementing better and better learning systems. Or if you want system analytics, market analytics, business analytics, whatever you want to term it, it's always a system so that you can draw out the information and the data uh, from businesses. Uh, and that refers to uh, financial flows, to return of investment, but it also refers to other experiences. Experiences how uh, companies overcome market barriers, how companies engage with customers, price points, et cetera, et cetera. And also impacts in the lives of customers. What kind of impact has a solar home system? Or, and I come to my second example, um, we're working at the moment with two uh, solar irrigation companies in Kenya. Both are startups, both were founded within the last five or six years. Both are growing quite quickly now. Uh, one is more on the manufacturing side, the other one is more on the service side, so they have solar irrigation and uh, don't just provide the pumps, but they also provide drip irrigation systems and, and a few other things. They have different price points, they're working in slightly different areas within Kenya. But these two together give you a very, very good idea about this sector and the market in Kenya. That's the type of learning that, I, that I'm speaking about. One of the lessons that I took out of the discussions last week uh, was that very often when you come to conferences like this one, people say, don't bother about the technology anymore. The technology is there. We now need to look at financing or we need to look at business models. Now that's half true. It's true we need to look at financing and the business models, but the technology is just going, the technology development is just going into a next iteration. Because these companies are developing very strongly on the technological side in order to bring the price point down. They want to lower the prices because their market will increase. They, are, uh, they, they, they will only get scale in terms, of product, in, in terms of their product when they simplify the product, can produce the same quality more cheaply and the same quality is very important in that context, uh, can bring the price down so that they can actually really spread into the market. It's a difficult game uh, between many players, but this price point battle is a technological battle to a large extent. Um, and these are things that are happening in Africa as we speak today. This is a fascinating entrepreneurial space that has a, an incredibly uh, great future and it is, it is um, a, a, pleasure, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to work uh, with many of the African colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. So, Nalina and Ajay, we've heard now about some sense of what their, the ambition which is there in that terms of infrastructure development in Africa. I'm also very happy that uh, people have also focused on what one could describe as soft infrastructure, the infrastructure of skills, the infrastructure of banking systems, without which you can't necessarily get the other stuff going. So would you like to come in here, Narin? And uh, he's been involved a lot in the, this area for supporting Africa. And I hope we can hear something about what's up, what's in the works. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Terry, for inviting me to speak on this, on Africa at this first World Sustainable Development Summit. I personally believe it is important that the summit has kept aside a separate plenary session for Africa, a continent that is determined to realize its potential, not only in terms of its development, but also in terms of becoming a dynamic force in the world. Uh, the African Union Agenda 263 outlines critical enablers for Africa's transformation. These include the international community respecting Africa's visions and aspirations. It also calls for learning from the diverse, unique and shared experiences and best past practices of various countries and regions on a basis, as a basis for forging an African approach to transformation. It has always been India's effort to help in Africa's transformation while respecting its aspirations. As you all know, there is no one Africa. Africa is a mosaic, not unlike India, in terms of diversity, religion, and culture. It is home to very, very old civilizations. It is marked by economic and geographical diversity. Taken together, Africa is undoubtedly the continent of the future, and it is the shared responsibility of the community, international community to ensure that Africa's potential converts into reality. 
It is a continent that can be a major source of international economic growth in the years ahead. It is a major force, source for food security, for clean energy, for energy security and maintaining environmental sustainability by retaining its tropical diversity. When speaking of sustainable infrastructure for its transformation, the maritime di dimension of Africa is equally important to bear in mind. Our chairperson mentioned this in his opening remarks. Africa's shores are washed by two oceans and the Mediterranean Sea. 31 of its 55 states are coastal states and seven are island states. This has obvious economic and infrastructure dimensions attached to it. Apart from the fact that a very considerable number of African countries are growing at a reasonably high growth rate, it is equally important to note that of its own volition, more, than, more and more African countries are transitioning to democratic governance. As you all are aware, India's links with the eastern coast of Africa, coast of Africa go way back in history. In the Hori past, it was a supercontinent of Gondwana land that broke off and became Africa, South Asia, Australia, etc. India's links with Africa have been sustained in the modern era, and these are not simply limited to the struggle for decolonization and against apartheid. From the 1960s, the early 1960s, India has willingly offered its developmental expertise, experiences, and resources to different nations in Africa. To begin with, our focus was on what is today perhaps the most important element in infrastructure development, namely human resource development and institution setting. While this remains a very important dimension of India's continuing collaboration with, with Africa, as India's own abilities have grown in nature and scope, our activities have broadened very substantially. As a result, <clears throat> India is today an important partner for Africa in its quest to achieve the objectives it has set for itself within the framework of the African Union. <clears throat> Excuse me. The most recent manifestation of India's collaboration with the countries of Africa began in 2008 with the first India-Africa Forum Summit. This was followed by the second summit in 2011 and the most recent summit in New Delhi where the entire continent was represented. In his opening address at the third Africa summit, India-Africa summit last October, Prime Minister Modi made it clear that India's collaboration efforts will inter alia contribute to the fulfillment of Africa's visions, vision of a prosperous, integrated and united continent. He promised at this summit that India will help connect Africa from Cairo to Cape Town, from Marrakesh to Mombasa, help develop its infrastructure, power and irrigation, help add value to resources, and set up industrial and information technology parks. He added that India will continue to assist in the development of Africa's human capital, including in the health, sec health sector, expand tele-education, continue to build institutions, help develop the agricultural sector, make available India's space, assets, and technology to act as a developmental multiplier, and expand India's flagship Pan-African e-network project. The commitment is also to deepen the India-Africa partnership in clean energy, sustainable habitat, and the blue economy. <clears throat> it would be clear from the above that India is committed to help in the development of sustainable infrastructure in Africa. This is a commitment matched by a financial commitment that runs into several billion dollars. The monies are in the process of being spent in consultation with our African partners on the basis of needs identified by them. It is not my intention, especially when time does not permit, <coughs> to throw a bunch of numbers at you with a view to highlighting India's huge commitment to Africa's transformation. We have had considerable experience in developing our programs in Africa and have also learned lessons where implementation has been inadequate. Corrective measures are being taken to ensure that we have learned from our mistakes and our future programs are more efficiently implemented. Africa's infrastructure needs are huge. Its potential for producing renewable energy is equally great. Yet investments in infrastructure do not produce immediate results and require a long-term commitment on the part of the developer and yield relatively low returns. This is not, however, a conundrum to which there is no solution. The potential of Africa as a source of future growth for the world economy is now well understood. 
Non-traditional donors have in recent years made serious inroads into Africa in infrastructure and other projects and are playing a greater role not only in the development of individual countries but also in enhancing sub-regional and regional connectivity. Of late, a huge quantum of the financial resources for this are coming from government sources and these investments and projects emerging therefrom will undoubtedly make it easier for new investments to be at attracted in the infrastructure sector from other non-government sources. This should also make it easier to put in place public-private partnerships in sectors such as transportation, water management, agriculture, and solar energy. More importantly, perhaps, the multilateral financial institutions and the G20 must step up to the plate. India has for long and consistently argued at the G20 that the international community must focus on the development of infrastructure in developing countries. This will have the added advantage of generating demand and help mitigate the continuing impact of the global financial and economic crisis. It is also the expectation insofar as India is concerned that the Indian private and public sectors will take advantage of the lines of credit offered by the Government of India for use in African countries for setting up infrastructure projects. It is pertinent to recall in this context that we in India have accumulated considerable experience, particularly in respect of the IT sector, railways, hydropower, electric transmission projects, and water management in Africa. Other areas include solar energy, and it is our hope that our partners in Africa will take up the offer made by Prime Minister Modi last year in October, inviting them to join the International Solar Alliance. Similarly, India's offer of space technology can play a game-changing role in helping transform the infrastructure landscape in Africa. It is pertinent in this context to recall the very important role space applications have played and continue to play in the development of the Indian economy. The benefits of this are already clear in Africa through India's Pan-African e-network project, which is now operational in 42 of the countries of that continent. 48 have signed on. Before concluding, I'd like to re reiterate what I said at the very outset. In helping develop sustainable infrastructure in Africa, it is critical to bear in mind that it is a diverse continent comprising 55 states which are at different stages of development. There are also regional organizations in Africa which have plans for integration. The approach to the continent has thus to be conducted at three levels, namely bilateral, regional, and pan-African. No one country or financial institution or group of multinational companies can singly address Africa's sustainable infrastructure needs. The need is for collaboration and to avoid duplication, to set common standards and to look at the developmental context rather than the limited context of bottom lines and or the extraction of resources. In this context, it is also important to ensure that Africa's rainforests are not only sustained but their illegal destruction is stopped and the damage done repaired. This particular ecosystem of Africa must be sustained and enlarged, not only for the sake of Africa, but for the sake of the world's ecological sustenance. Thank you. I now request Ajay. Thank you, Nitin. Uh, since I have to kind of round, up, round off this uh, discussion, let me start with uh, Vision 2063, uh, two years ago, which uh, the African continent adopted for itself, its SDGs. Um, these are roughly the same as the SDGs themselves. They want, what do they want to do? Manage resources wisely and sustainably so that every citizen has a fair chance to lead a healthy, a prosperous, a fulfilling life free of poverty. But as was pointed out by uh, the previous speaker, the African mosaic is increasingly in the spotlight, and this is something we have to understand. You know, in the past and even now, the focus of the Western media on the continent has been like what we call parachute journalism, where you kind of project stereotypical images and keep uh, writing about them. But Africa has changed. The real story is about the continent's awakening the growing efforts being made to address the delivery of infrastructure and basic services to many of its communities. What do we mean by infrastructure? What is it that is needed up here? 
I would say water, energy, health, transport, and banking and finance. And what, if I were to think as an African, um, and I do have some familiarity with it having my first language which I studied was Swahili uh, in Kenya, uh, um, and uh, living in Kenya and Seychelles, uh, I would say what they want is a sound of hope in their village homes. They want the sizzling hum of electricity, they want the gushing of water, bringing health, bringing sanitation. So in recent, uh, uh, in recent years, there are several positive trends that have generated a rising Africa narrative. We have heard of some uh, from previous speakers. The continent is fast growing, as Miyaza pointed out. It has a bright future, and the annual GDP growth over the next few decades being projected is at about 6% per annum, and that is in a situation when uh, Europe is largely stagnating, so is Japan, and other major parts of major economies too are not doing particularly well, beyond, I would say, the Indian economy, and uh, to a lesser extent on a declining uh, curve, but still growing the Chinese economy, and perhaps USA. So what does it mean? Uh, if you look at it, this impressive economic growth also needs to be understood, because if you look at it, the improvements in health, education, nutrition, water, sanitation, and energy access are not, not really there to be found as yet. If you look at it in terms of um, uh, the human development index uh, terms, 20 of the high growth countries of Af Africa still rank below 120 out of the 193 countries of the world. So there is much that needs to be done. If you look at Africa as a whole, 11% of the world's population, but 24% of the disease burden. So uh, as I said, there are persisting and growing inequalities that need to be addressed. Uh, the Africa Progress Panel report that came out last year pointed out, and I'll just focus on energy because I don't think I'll have time for anything else, that over 600 million to 700 million Africans still do not have access to modern energy. Uh, if you look at the sub-Saharan grid, it has a generation capacity of 90 gigawatts. Half of it, for example, is in one country, South Africa. There's much to be done there. And on current trends, unless this trend changes, it will take Africa until 2080 to achieve universal access to electricity. So much needs to be done, and we need to help in many ways. Uh, finally, climate change will also aggravate the problem facing Af uh, the African people. Uh, like in South Asia, you can find many of the poor and uh, undernourished in Africa, and they will be disproportionately harmed by climate change. Uh, I will switch now to pointing out that uh, it is a region of great untapped potential, and it is poised to play, as uh, uh, was pointed out by Ambassador Suri, uh, a very significant role in the global arena, uh, in which India, I will not go into the um, aspects of India-Africa cooperation, I think they've been uh, very well brought out already. But I think the point to be made here is when you look at the SDGs and Vision 2063, they will only succeed if we can get them to succeed in Africa. And I would say Africa and India, because India too has some way to go. And I think we are heading in the right direction and we are happy to hold the hands of African brothers and sisters and move ahead. Because our growing populations must most need the change that is described in the SDG and the Vision 2063 agenda. Uh, we have had, uh, we have had um, agreement on words at ADIS 2013 um, in New York and Paris uh, last year, uh, and now it's time to follow up with action. I think uh, it is said that actions speak louder than words. We have the words, and I would say words followed by actions will speak even louder. Now is the time for all the countries to come forward and help take Africa forward. I will just end with one quote as to what Terry has been doing in this regard, because I think it would be worth very quickly in three or four sentences sharing it with this audience. We, uh, Terry took its first South-South cooperation initiative in 1983. We have trained under even our DFID Africa project nearly 700 experts from Africa. We have provided uh, expertise to over 450 solar and cook stove technicians and trainers in Ethiopia and Africa. Uh, we are uh, providing biomass gasifier technology in parts of Africa. Annually we train in cooperation with the Ministry of External Affairs under its ITEC program 
a very well thought out and drawn up program. Annually, we train 250 experts in Terry under nine programs. And of these, in the last two years, 50% have been from Africa. And very interestingly, 45% uh, of them hail from West Africa, uh, within Africa itself. Uh, my last point, Terry has also benefited from local wisdom and insights while sharing these technologies and helping their transition and development in the villages of Africa. And I think this makes it also a very good example of the importance of sharing of development experiences. So we are involved in human resource development and capacity building, but at the same time, in the process of skill upgrading and technology sharing, we are also learning from our African friends. And that, I think, is my last point. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> I'm not sure that we have any time left, do we? May I ask some of the organ? Just a minute or two, good. So I'm sorry, I will have to, I'm not able to take questions from the uh, audience. Let me just try and get the, the, the overall sense that we get is that there's great potential uh, in Africa. And I think I must thank the panel for the, this exercise and welcome the minister as she comes here to, uh, to speak to us. Thank you very much. Yeah.